Good morning. Well, hey, if we haven't had a chance to meet, I'm Jeff Young. I'm the lead pastor along with my wife, Carissa. And so uh, I'd love to meet you afterward if you are available. That'd be wonderful. Um, Bob did uh, remind us, though, just that we do offer prayer after every single service. So if there's something that you need prayer for, there will be people on the sides that would love to pray with you. So um, would you do me a favor and open up your Bibles? Because who brought the real Bible? Who brought a real, like, hardbound Bible? Yeah! I love it. I love that so much. But you can also click open to it. It's, it's a little, it's not as good, but it's cool. Um, it's, it'll work for now. Um, hey, for real, though, if you are in the Bible, I'm super happy. Like, very, very happy. I would love to encourage you. We're going through this series in Acts. And so I want to encourage you, there's 28 chapters in Acts. How many days are there in a month? Usually 30. So you get to skip two days, but every other day you read one chapter a day in Acts and you'll stay with us and you'll read through all of these stories that we're preaching on and you'll be able to go through things that we're actually preaching on. And that's a really fun thing to be able to do because um, I love what the Lord does is he just opens up, um, he gives us revelation, he gives us, he gives us clarity on the word of God and, and especially as we preach it, uh, it'll, it'll uh, connect a lot of dots for us as we do this. So uh, we're in chapter four. Um, it's taken us four weeks to get through chapter four. Um, we are, but this is the deal. This is kind of a weird thing. We're going at the end of four and into the beginning of five this week. So uh, the way that they mapped out the Bible, maybe they shouldn't, I don't know. I, I don't understand why they did all the chapters and verses the way they chose to do it. But this is one story right here. So I want to encourage you as I read this, we're seeing two, glim- like we're seeing uh, generosity to its fullest, the way in which the church is supposed to be generous. And then we see a drop dead kind of generosity that we're a little bit like, if you're a preacher, you kind of read that and you're like, do I really have to preach on this, Lord? Because that's not exciting to preach about, and you'll understand why in a few minutes. And so um, where we are in this passage, Peter and John had just got let out of the Sanhedrin. They, uh, they came back to the believers, told them everything that had happened, and what did they do? Oh, man. What was the first thing they did? They prayed together. Okay, I'll lead the way on this one. You guys are a little timid this morning. That's all right. They prayed together. They exalted the Lord, they prayed out, they, they, they prayed scripture, they did all of these things where they, they were united in prayer together, and then it says that they are going to share together, okay, they're going to share together, we're going to get to see what this looks like, but I want to I kind of share with you, in times of problems, in times of persecution, in times of trouble, you want to be together, everybody say together, you want to be together with the body of Christ because when you're together with the body of Christ, we pray together and we don't go, oh, this is what you need to do. You need to do this, 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 and this. No, no, no. You go, Lord, what do you want us to do? It's such a better perspective. So just come to the feet of the Lord and go, Lord, I know I have all my thoughts. I know I have all my opinions. I know I have all my frustrations, but I lay myself down at your feet and I say, what do you want to do with my life? What do you want to do in the midst of the trials? What do you want to do in the midst of the trouble? And I'm yours. And so uh, what we get to see is in the midst of these problems and persecutions, the church comes together. We need to be together. We are better together. I will use that phrase till the day is old, but like we need one another in, a, in really, really, really strong ways. Um, in this portion of scripture, we're also seeing kind of a shadow of what they were doing right away. In chapter two, they were they ate together, they prayed together, they taught together, they had fellowship together. They were doing the very things that they should do. And now when problems really hit, what do you end up doing? You do what you practice. And so they're doing the very things that they were doing at the very beginning. As soon as Christ ascended to be with the Father, they were doing all of these things. And now persecution's coming, problems and challenges coming. And what do they do? They, they forge together. They don't run away and hide and be alone and be isolated like we love to do as humans. Um, I, I want to encourage us. That's what the church is showing us here is this beautiful picture that we come together in prayer with one another. Okay, so I'm going to read uh, verses, chapter 4, verse 32 through 37, and then we'll jump into chapter 5. This is the really fun part, by the way. So just prep yourself for the not-so-fun part, okay? But this part is beautiful. This is the beautiful church at work uh, together. So it says this, All the believers were in one heart and one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had with great power. Everybody say power. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them 
all. Okay, in them all. Not a single person was left out of this. In them all. So every single one of you in the room this morning, the power of God is available to you right now. Somebody should say amen a little louder. Well, that was okay. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that uh, there were no needy persons among them. For from the time, for excuse me, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from their sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles call, called Barnabas, which means sons, son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles. Feet. So it says that they were of one mind and one heart. They were united in spirit. They were united together as the body of Christ. This is just a beautiful, beautiful uh, look at what the church was like. This new birth church was just so in love with one another and cared for one another so deeply that they said, I want to take care of your need. They looked outside of themselves. This is just a beautiful picture of selflessness. It's like, I look outside of myself and I see everybody in here. I see your needs. And if I can help fulfill one of those needs, then I, I'm in. And it says time to time, that doesn't say that every single person sold their house. But from time to time, there'd be people where the Lord would put something on your heart so strongly that, hey, I'm gonna sell this thing or I'm gonna give this thing away because it's gonna meet somebody else's need. And what they did, they would lay it at the apostles' feet because they trusted the apostles to do what was right. They saw, the apostles had the bigger picture. They, they understood where all the needs were. And so it says they distributed them as they had need. This is, anybody else, this is beautiful. Just a few, okay. I, I think I shared last week, if we just took a second every day and prayed, Lord, may this day be about somebody else. May it not be about me. If we would let go of selfishness and give in to selflessness, we would see a radically transformed society. Is this not what our society needs? Radical transformation. Anybody? Anybody? Okay, now you're, okay, okay. Oh, I'm getting some claps. All right. Hallelujah. Woo. All right. You guys can clap. It's fine. I like it. Because we have emotion too. You guys, go, go watch my sermon last week. Okay, I love this because this speaks to anywhere you're at in life, okay? Whether you're, you're retired, whether you're part of the church, you're in ministry, maybe you were in ministry, maybe you, you're, you're a boss, maybe you're a teacher, whatever you're doing, if you have mission and everybody else around you has mission, man, there is some like solidarity. It's like we're climbing this hill together like, and we're in it for one another. So we're going to get the prize. So here at Life Church, like, hey, we want to connect people to Jesus. However we can do that, man, let's go. And so when we have vision, people come alongside and go, yes, let's, let's, let's accomplish that together. Without vision, people lose clarity. They have no clarity. They get confused, and then they start fighting against one another. That's a very unhealthy organization and or church. Maybe you've been part of one of those. You don't need to raise your hand if you were, or if you are, don't raise your hand. <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, I love that you're here at Life Church. We really do want to strive for Jesus. It's not about this guy. It's not about our worship team. It's not about any one of us. It's about us together promoting Jesus for the, for the, for the kingdom of God. And so when, we, when, we, when we're so centered on that, we let go of all the things that really trouble us and bother us and frustrate us because we stop thinking about ourselves. And we begin to form this, this, this brotherhood of believers that is so for one another. Oh, I love it. That's why I kind of, I love the 10 days of prayer because how can I bless another church? How can I just, how can I minister to others? How can I, if I can bless them, they, man, I love that so much that we're in this together. We want to have this mission together. 
It says that no one claimed that any of their possessions were their own. They were, they were in essence, saying this. We are stewards of what God has given us, not owners. Okay, a steward is one who says, Lord, what do you want me to do with the resource that you've given me? Whether it be a lot or a little, it doesn't matter. Okay, whether you've got nothing in your bank account or whether you have millions in your bank account, it doesn't matter. I'm going to be a good steward of what God's given me. I am not an owner of it. That's mine, Lord. That's mine for me. That's my retirement. That's my safety. That's whatever. You can have all the other things, mostly. We'll talk about those later, but this one, for sure. So if the Lord comes to you and places something on your heart, says, hey, you need to give your car away to to the one who doesn't have it. Are you going to do it? Like, man, that's some, that's some serious generosity. But this is what they did. They knew that when they would give it away, they knew there was such trust and care for one another that the needs would be met and not they wouldn't be abused, which is something that we need to gain trust on. So when we're good stewards of our life, of our resource, of what God's given us, people see that and they go, I can trust you. I can trust you with, with, with what I've given you. So they shared everything they had. There was no needy person among them. This was before governmental assistance, which we've leaned in way too heavily on. No, I pay my taxes. It's fine. Yeah, it's it's kind of a broken system, I might say. It's not exactly meeting the needs of the heart. So when people have needs, that's fine. You meet the need, but you get to their heart. And when you get to their heart, you can bring Jesus to them. That's on mission, connecting people to Jesus. Jesus said it. He said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. This is, this is that right here. Their love for one another was proving to the world that they were his disciples. Uh, they had extreme generosity. They had incredible care for the needy. And they had their powerful testimony. By the power of the Holy Spirit given to them, we'll talk about that in a minute, they were able to share. These are three things that we can do right now. There's nothing stopping you from being extremely generous, caring for the needy, and sharing your testimony. How about three challenges this week? Whoa. All right, Lord, how do you want me to be generous? All right, Lord, how do you want me to share my testimony? All right, Lord, how do you want me to care for the the ones that are in need? And he's going to put people in your path and give you plenty of opportunity if you're ready for it. Anybody else ready for it? You want to make a difference around you? Be ready for it. Open your eyes and invite the Lord to to direct your sight and your ears and your heart to whatever he's pointing to. And he'll hone you in on, oh, okay, I I sense, I feel the Lord is leading me in this area. So it says that he gave them great power, okay? This great power with the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. This, This power is used often. It's dunamis power. And this power is actually where they get the word dynamite. Anybody like explosions. Powerful, right? This dunamis power, this is, this is a miraculous power, force, ability, or a, and abundant might. In most biblical instances, this power is regarded as an attribute either of God, who is in control of all powers, or subservient divine agents. This sounds crazy, okay, stick with me. Subservient divine agents acting on his behalf through delegated powers. In other words, this is God Almighty giving us the Holy Spirit to endow us with power like he did with Christ. The Holy Spirit has his power, and now he's giving his disciples the same power. Jesus says, I will give you power and authority. All right, so this is this power that's put on us. This is what we see in Acts chapter 1, where it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Romans 1 says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Basically, Paul is saying, like, look around at creation. It's undeniable that we have a good God. It's undeniable. Oh, love this. Romans 15 says this, uh, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope. Anybody want to overflow with hope? Oh, okay. 
I know that I would love to overflow with hope because that thing, man, whoo, sometimes it gets a little low and you, and you get a little bit. When it gets a little low, this is what's happening. You're looking internally. You're looking at yourself. You're looking at your problems. You're looking at your circumstances. When you are overflowing with hope, you go, Jesus. I look past my own life into eternity and I go, I have an eternity with me waiting for me. And so now I have this different perspective that this hope is overflowing within me by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit that I have this overflowing hope. And then in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says it this way, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his Holy Spirit in your inner being. I don't know. I would like more hope and I would like more power and strength. Okay. I'm glad we're all on the same page this morning. Okay. And then it says that God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. I just want to hit this real quick. It's so vital that you understand how valuable you are in the kingdom of God. If you have said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in you. This power resides in you. Wow. Not a single one of us should be on the outside looking in, going, man, I wish I had that. No, we all, everybody, say all. We all have this. It's all at our fingertips. We all have this. Jesus has given it to us. It's God's grace was so powerfully at work in us all, this dunamis power. And then it's through this power that we're able to testify. So, If you're really nervous about sharing your testimony, how about you pray, Holy Spirit, give me power, give me authority, give me boldness, give me clarity to share my word with with others, share your word with others, my testimony with others. Give me that boldness that I can testify. This is to bear witness of. This is what Jesus was talking about in Luke 24. He says, you are my witnesses to these things. You know, if you're called on the witness stand, you what? You testify. So I'm going to be a witness to testify of what God has done. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that gives me this, this uh, like strength and courage, like, like a steel backbone that says, no, I'm not going to back down from this. I'm going to share exactly what, what has happened I'm in my life and what God has done. Real quickly, before we get to the really fun stuff, Barnabas. Let's talk about him. His nickname was Son of Encouragement. Like, I want that nickname so badly. Son of encouragement. This, is, this word encouragement is the same uh, periclesis word in Greek that says that's used for the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Man, have you, you know those people. You just come alongside of you and you just feel very encouraged. You feel comforted by them. This is what Barnabas was. And he went and he sold his land and he took the proceeds and with I'm sure, just incredible generosity and cheerfulness. He laid it at the apostles' feet and said, you guys, you're doing such a good job. I cannot wait to see what you do with these funds. It's going to be amazing what God does through this, these funds that, that I get to, I have the honor of giving to you this morning. This is going to be so amazing. Barnabas, the son of encouragement, also was traveling partners with Paul through ministry, through, through many different nations or countries, and he, sh- he planted churches with Paul, and then he broke off of Paul and began planting other churches. I mean, this man came alongside, encouraged, and comforted those in need. How? By the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to be encouraged? Holy Spirit. Give me a spirit of encouragement. You want to be encouraged? I say it all the time. You want to be encouraged? Encourage somebody else. And by their reaction, that alone will encourage you. And it fixes the problem immediately. And they go, whoa, that was awesome. That was incredible. And then it builds and it, and it, and it breeds off one another. So he sold the land, laid it at the apostles' feet with a smile on his face and said, You guys go for it. This is going to be so awesome to see what God does. Okay, now let's get into chapter 5. This is going to be so exciting. People dropping dead. It's awesome. This is the passage that I've, I've like read many times before, and I'm like, Lord, I pray that you never have me preach on this passage. 
like, I don't know if I ever want to talk about this passage in, in, in church ever, but here we are, and I'm not going to avoid it. This is just what's going on. And, and I, I, I asked the question, like, why did they put this in the Bible? Luke, you could have, like, kept that one out, man. You could have just, like, kept things going with this beautiful church that we just read about. That one, author, one, one, one author, he says that this is the, the first shadow on a bright church. Anybody else realize that church isn't always the best or greatest? Anybody else been wounded, hurt, scarred? Oh man, I pray not. But if you have, you understand. Church is a place that can be painful. And we recognize that. Like, I have the wounds inside to, to speak of them. But we get to read stories like this. So it takes us, it, it gives us a second to go, okay, Lord, what are you sharing with us in this really hard passage? And we come to it with humility, and we go, Lord, you got something to teach us. It, there's a reason it's in here. There's a reason. So I'm going to read one, verses 1 through 5, and then, or 1 through 11, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. It says, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. And when, an, when Ananias heard this, he fell, he fell down and died. You're welcome. This is awesome. It says, And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you paid you, excuse me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At the moment she fell down, at that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. You're welcome, number two. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I, I love the word of God. I'm so grateful for it, even when you have to, like, kind of wrestle through some things. So just because you hit something hard in Scripture, please don't just, like, oh, I'm done with this. I don't, I just, just keep going. Just keep asking questions. Dig in. So this is the first shadow on the bright church. You know, the church, especially those in Scripture, my, if you're really going to Old Testament, you're talking about leaders of the church and you're talking about Moses who murdered a guy, David who committed adultery, Jonah who ran away from God, what he was asking them to do. Over and over again, we see story after story of, of people's failures. Anybody else a failure in the room? You don't have to raise your hand, but I mean, I mean, like, we're, we, we've all, in some way, shape, or form, totally blown it. But God's grace is so profound. And he says, I could still use you. I still not only could just use you like a, a pawn. No, no. I have a plan and a purpose for you that will be so satisfying, that will be so fulfilling. This is our God. This is our God. I love this. So even with the imperfect church, Jesus we are the bride of, of, of Christ. He loves us. And he says, I've got a plan for us here at Life Church. I've got a plan for the whole church. So here's Ananias and Sapphira. 
hey, babe, I got a great idea. Let's sell our land. We'll keep some of the proceeds, but we'll kind of act like we gave all of it away. We'll keep the goods and we'll get the glory. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Anybody else with me? Like, this is a great plan. We'll look really good for like, like Barnabas and we'll be able to just have some on the side, you know? Like, because you never know. Rainy day fun. You never know if we just might need to buy another property. You just, let's just be careful. Okay, sounds good. Peter receives, in my opinion, this is me reading into it. It doesn't say this, so I'll throw that out there. But we see time and time again the Holy Spirit moving in powerful ways. This is, in my opinion, a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit is, is, is understanding of something significant in somebody else's life. Peter sits back and goes, Ananias, why are you lying? Well, where, what, do you, what, do you, what do you mean? So this is, this is a profound moment where the Holy Spirit is just like, Peter, you're leading. Ask the question, why are you lying? They gave into temptation, deceit, greed, dishonesty, covetedness. Those were the sins they committed. It wasn't because they, they didn't give everything. By the way, remember at the very beginning of the, of, well, in chapter four, it was, and some of them sold their property, not all of them. And so Peter's like, dude, you didn't have to give anything. You didn't, it was your land to begin with. Like God gave you that land and, and then you sold it and, and then you had the money and, and he's like, dude, and you didn't have to give any of it. But you decided to lie to all of us and, and then give some as though you gave to the whole. This is great to see from them. When one lies to deceive, whether it be God or other believers or other people, we ruin our testimony. We lose it. And so we want to walk in this truth. We want to walk with integrity. We want to walk as believers to this higher calling. It's not just some, some little thing. It, it, this is like, man, this is a big deal. So Peter calls them out for it. He's like, Ananias, what are you doing, man? And he falls down dead. And that word de uh, dead in the Greek, um, I'll spare you me trying to pronounce it, but it's to breathe one's last or to die. And then, it, and then it says, usually it goes along with death by divine judgment. This happens multiple times throughout Scripture. And then what happens? So Ananias drops dead. These poor guys, these young men have to come in and like, Peter's like, I'm not doing it. Guys, hey, hey, you guys, yeah, yeah, you, you. Can you guys take him out and bury him? Man, what a sad way to end things. So he drops dead and... And great fear, it says, seized all who heard about it. Great fear seized all who heard about it. Three hours later, his wife comes in. She has no idea. She thinks everything's going really great. She thinks, ha, ha, man, yeah, we're getting some prominence here. We've got some money on the side. I haven't seen it in a nice for a little while. And Peter goes, hey, um, Sapphira, did, did you guys actually sell this for what you said and she said, well, yeah, 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 cool, 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 yeah, mm? And then he says, why are you lying? Why would you, why would you conspire with your husband against the Spirit of God? That's what he says. And then he says, the very feet you hear are the ones that are going to carry you out and bury you next to your husband. Wow. What I, if you look at these two instances, Ananias was confronted, drops dead. Sapphira, she gets asked the question, hey, is this really what you sold it for? And my question might be like, Peter, why didn't you ask Ananias? I, I would want to know. 
But he asks Sapphira, hey, is this really the price? Yeah. She was given a second chance to repent. She was given another opportunity to say, yeah, we blew it. I know I, I went along with it, or, well, it's kind of both for our idea. I, would, I just, I'm so sorry. Please forgive us. I, I wonder if maybe she would not have dropped dead, and I wonder if Ananias would have been resurrected. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's just wondering. But no, she, she doubled down on her sin. And if there's any warning I can give you today, you should take sin seriously and not double down on your sin. But instead, surrender it to Jesus. Surrender it all. And walk with a pure heart. Walk with integrity. You might look horrible from the outside, but you will be clean on the inside. I'll take that every day. I'll take that every day. So I want to I encourage you. Don't go down on your sin and drop dead. Probably two good ideas. After she drops dead, the same poor kids have to come wrap her up and go bury her next to her husband. Nice funeral service, by the way. But here's, here's what I love. Here's, here's what I, I, I believe that the Lord would want us to understand out of this passage. It says that great, the great fear, at the beginning from Ananias, it says it, the great fear seized all who heard. Now this says great fear seized the whole church. Because the church went, I better be really mindful about how I'm living my life but not only that, how I'm actually presenting my life. The two should be the same in integrity and in holiness because we're called to be holy. So this is a high standard. When you say yes to the Lord, it's like, oh man, amen, amen, and amen. Yes? Anybody else? Yes? Okay. And then I go, I have a life unto the Lord that I have to take seriously that I'm going to be a good steward of, that I'm going to be humble enough to go, hey, I, I blew it, I messed up. I need forgiveness just like anybody else. I need God's grace just like anybody else. But this serves as a clear warning for the church saying, the Lord's taking this seriously. He's taking, he loves his church. He loves you. And he hates sin. He hates it. Why? Because it separates you from him. And he loves you dearly. So this is why we don't want to be like Sapphira, who actually, in my opinion, did, did the worst because she doubled down again. Let's just say, I'm so sorry, Lord. I'm so, so sorry. I'm going to have a worship team come up. We're going to close in prayer, or worship. <laughs> the worship team's going to come up and pray for us. It's going to be great. Um, as they come up, there's, friends, if you would look up, just, I, I won't go through all of the rest of scriptures I have right now, but just thinking about the fear of God, that we should fear God. Uh, Proverbs says the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and understanding. Um, there's plenty, plenty of scriptural support for that. God created us. We're his creation. It's like we have to have honor and, and, and this awe for him. And we also want to have a high regard, uh, maybe a high understanding of sin. Because I think we're living in a culture where sin is not a thing. Like, no, 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 no. You do you. And whatever you do, it's fine. So therefore, there's, there's really no sin. Culture wants to tell you you are innocent, and the reality is we're not. And that, that's a hard thing, like, oh, man, oh. But we see so clearly what sin does. 
And so we want to walk with Jesus as he purifies our heart, as he, as he cleanses us. Create in me, O oh, oh Lord, a clean heart is what David cried out after he committed adultery. Like these, these, This is exactly what we want to do with the Lord. So let's stand together. Um, we're going to close out in worship, but I, I want to encourage you, you know, depending on where you're at with the Lord or with church, you know, like there, there's maybe several things that you heard this morning that Maybe you want to dig, dig a little deeper. Maybe you need prayer or whatever. We, we want to do that with you. We'll pray with you and talk with you on the sides over here uh, after worship. But friends, most importantly, Jesus wants your heart. He wants you. He, wa- he wants all of you. And not in a like, give me, in a very healthy, healthy way. So as we worship, you have the opportunity, Lord, here I am. I'm yours. I'm going to steward my life the way you've given it to me. So have your way. Whatever you're asking of me, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. And if you need to say yes to Jesus, oh my goodness, we'll pray with you. But on the way out, we have these little yes packets all over the place. Grab, just grab one. Like even if you're new to the Lord or maybe you've been with the Lord for a long time and you need a refresher, grab one of these and it'll help you walk through the next steps just to get going with the Lord. So please, please do that. So let's pray and we'll worship. Jesus, we love you. Lord, we thank you for your word that while has some challenging stories in it that make us kind of step back a little bit, Lord, you've given these to us for great purpose and reason. So we honor you. We honor your word that's holy. And so we love you and we ask, Jesus, would you just have your way with every single person in the room? I thank you that you've brought them here today for a very specific reason. Not to hear condemnation, not to hear this guilt trip, but just to in the invitation of coming into more of what you have for them. That you want relationship with them, that you want to dine with them, you want to talk with them, you want to have communion with them. So I pray that we would feel drawn into you in all of the ways. In Jesus' name, amen. to sing part of the song that we sang earlier today and just declare that Christ is our firm foundation.
a firm foundation. God, that you don't get shaken when we fail time and time again. Lord, but that you will never fail us, God. And that's why we want our foundation built on you, God. God, we want that firm place that won't be shaken when the winds come, Lord. We won't be shaken when sin tries to come after us, Lord, but that we will walk away from the sin and draw closer to your heart, God. So we thank you, God, for your goodness. God, we thank you for your sacrifice that you made a way for us to love you and know you. God, you are so gracious to us, God. And we give you all the praise and glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week. Sign up for life groups.